Good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you for this IIEA webinar. We're delighted to be joined today by Edward Burke, Assistant Professor in International Relations at the University of Nottingham, who has been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak to us. Dr. Burke will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll move into a Q&A with our audience, both of which are on the record. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once we come to the Q&A. Please also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Um, I will now formally introduce Dr. Burke and hand over to him. Dr. Edward Burke is an assistant professor in international relations at the University of Nottingham. His research interests include peacekeeping, stability operations, civil military relations, and the history of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations. Dr. Burke has spent prolonged periods researching conflicts in countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, and Yemen. From 2010 to 2011, he was deputy head of the International Police Coordination Board in Kabul, Afghanistan. Dr. Burke has also worked as a foreign policy fellow at Frida in Madrid and at the Center for European Reform in London. So with that, over to you, Ed. Thanks very much, Ross, and my, my thanks to the Institute as well for, for inviting me to, uh, uh, to, to talk about Afghanistan today. Um, I have to say it's been, you know, it's been in terms of um, the last number of weeks is it feels extremely personal uh, in, in terms of the, the um, you know, some of the friends and, uh, and former colleagues that I have there who are, you know, currently in hiding and unfortunately we're not um, able to, to make it out of Kabul in time. Um, Nonetheless, I'll, I'll do my best to sort of reflect on what has been, uh, without doubt, uh, a humiliating uh, you know, number of weeks for, I would say, for the United States, but, but also for, for, the, for, the, for uh, the wider NATO uh, organization and, of course, um, as well for the European Union, which invested so much in Afghanistan, uh, not least through its police mission, but also through assistance uh, via the delegation. So I'll try, and I think it's, it's certainly a time for a lot of humility and, and reflection. So I'm really pleased that the Institute uh, has taken the opportunity to, to host this event. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A with such a, an experienced range of uh, people who've joined us today. Uh, in beginning, I want to, you know, first of all, draw attention to uh, President Biden's speech nine days ago, uh, the 31st of August, that, that deadline that was set in terms of the uh, to end uh, the withdrawal from, from Kabul airport. And Biden in that speech said, a quote, that what is the, the vital national interest? In my view, we have only one, to make sure Afghanistan can never be used to launch an attack on our homeland. Remember why we went to Afghanistan in the first place? Because we were attacked by Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda on September the 11th, 2001, and they were based in Afghanistan. We delivered justice to bin Laden on May 2nd, 2011, over a decade ago. Al-Qaeda was decimated. And for me, the, the critical word here in Biden's speech is the past tense of was. I mean, you know, he doesn't refer, of course, to the number two of Al Qaeda. I mean, Al Zawahiri, who is believed by uh, the U.S. Department of Defense and the CIA to be presently in Afghanistan, um, and as UN secretaries and other, including U.S. Department of Defense reports, have made clear, the reality is, of course, that Al Qaeda has been resurgent in Afghanistan. Um, we've been sort of very much uh, focused on Islamic State Khorasan over the last number of weeks, but by far the more uh, robust, uh, stronger organization in Afghanistan in terms of international jihadi terrorist uh, network organization is, of course, Al-Qaeda. And its number one short-term aim in recent years has been to secure the U.S. the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Al-Zawahiri um, and others have described it as the enemy acknowledging its defeat. Um, and according to U.S. Uh, Central Command assessments, uh, Al-Zawahiri continues to lead Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan uh, in, in recent months and and so this is very much in terms of you know his long war uh, this has been the, the short-term objective now for a number of years and, and in terms of you know how al-qaeda has been operating well they have been uh, really linking to that insurgency in terms of um, you know we see them uh, in the taliban security apparatus uh, particularly with regards to the haqqani network in the east and the south of the country um, but al-qaeda of course you know we are not looking at a group that are afghan nationalists they, they, are, they have a, a strategy which at present seems to be consolidating its strength in South Asia. And so we've also seen Al-Qaeda um, training quite a number of Tariqa Taliban, uh, Pakistani uh, uh, terrorist group uh, fighters. And they've in recent years developed new ties with jihadi organizations in Central Asia and Kashmir. 
including to groups in, that are opposed rather than linked to the Pakistani state. Um, and so, you know, th th this is something that is profoundly alarming. And of course, you know, President Biden was sort of, you know, didn't confront that and, and, and didn't talk about it. So, but, but what is clear then is, of course, that, you know, we have a robust strengthening organization in Al Qaeda. Um, and they do, its leadership do remain committed to attacking the West. <clears throat> but that does not mean that a, a major attack is imminent in the West. Um, for now, as I say, there seems to be, appears to be, uh, to a certain extent, a um, strategy of consolidation in, in South Asia. And, and to some extent as well in Central Asia. But the risks of a, of a Taliban that is, of course, enduringly supportive of Al-Qaeda um, should be evident, I think, to most people. And indeed, the Taliban have, of course, learned the art of propaganda very well uh, since the rather chaotic years of late 1990s. Unfortunately, there is really little moderation to be found within its inner circles, um, even if some of its tribal supporters, of course, are far less militant. Um, and so this linkage between uh, the Taliban Haqqani network, the uh, support and uh, you know frequent frequent dialogue between Al Qaeda and, and and the Taliban's leaders are of course well documented. Um, and indeed, if we look at the top of the the new uh, government or regime that we have in Kabul, we can see that in terms of the, the you know the Taliban Emir Mullah Habibullah, Mullah Habibullah, I mean he he himself is um, you know his, his own son was uh, a suicide bomber in 2017. Um, the new Minister for the Interior that was announced is, of course, the Haqqani network leader, Siraj Haqqani, who's, of course, a long-standing ally in support of Al-Qaeda and is you know, one of the U.S.'s most wanted. But I think we shouldn't be naive about sort of holding out hopes that leopards have a lot, to, have a lot of spots to change here. Um, I think, and, and so it, it has been excruciating to some extent to listen to uh, some Biden administration officials sort of and indeed in the UK as well, so to try and avoid, you know, using, uh, pointing out that, you know, the, the Taliban is still, uh, has, has these individuals uh, are very much at the centre of, of, of power um, and, and trying to avoid using words like, you know, an enemy of the United States or, or people like Hikani, who's on, again, on the FBI's most wanted list, you know. I mean, it's, 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 been, it's been an excruciating experience, I think, for the Biden administration and for, for the Department of Defence and the State Department. But what, I suppose, what is consistent, however, about the United States' approach to Afghanistan is that every time a US president says the job in Afghanistan is done, things get worse. And that was definitely the case under President Bush in 2002. I'd say President Obama in 2014, after the cessation of US NATO major combat operations as part of the intercal or transition process. Uh, President Trump, of course, in February 2020, after his disastrous deal with the Taliban, which the latter organization, of course, steadily violated over a 16 month period. And, and President Biden now. Um, facts have really, unfortunately, not got in the way of timetables that are influenced by US domestic politics. So let's go back 20 years and, and ask where we, the international community, or I suppose more accurately, NATO and the European Union went wrong. Um, first of all, it was, I think it was a failure in, in 2001 to acknowledge that we were intervening and recalibrating what was already a very long civil war in Afghanistan. And nearly 20 years ago, in November 2001, um, Irish, then Irish Foreign Minister uh, Brian Cowan made a speech at the UN Security Council. And, and he said, we believe that a fully representative and broad-based government will express the will of all its people and, and ensure long-term peace and security in the country. Um, as to the best way of achieving these objectives, Ireland considers strongly that the process should be led by the United Nations. As a member of the Security Council, Ireland will work to ensure that a sufficient mandate was developed um, and the evolving situation on the ground would, would, would necessitate flexibility and adaptability. Um, so in terms of what, what Cowan hoped for, um, well, unfortunately, what we saw there and once thereafter was an extremely punitive approach by the United States and its allies in Afghanistan, uh, punishing those who were aligned on one side with the, with the sort of broad Taliban network, um, but may have had very just local grievances for, for joining the Taliban insurgency in, in the mid 90s due to abuses carried out during the Afghan civil war by some of the individuals who now found themselves key figures in uh, President Hamid Karzai's new government, transitional government in, in 2002. Um, as a long standing UN and EU diplomat in Afghanistan, Francesco Vendral put it, the warlords were the original sin. And, and you know, those Taliban affiliated tribes so now found themselves um, really sort of under the thumb of their. Uh, former enemies or adversaries in a local context, in particularly in the south and east of the country. 
Attempts by local tribal leaders formerly allied to the Taliban to reach out to the new Afghan government of the United States were often rebuffed. Uh, some were killed after surrendering, others imprisoned, including in Bagram and Guantanamo for many years. The seeds of insurgency, I would argue, lay there uh, and they flourished with every mounting grievance. I don't think, unlike people, you know, Rory Stewart has talked about how you know, we, we lacked enough knowledge. I, I don't think this was necessarily, a, 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 particularly in, in foreign ministries, etc. cetera. I, I, I don't really buy that. You know, I, I think actually there was a significant amount of knowledge. There were many diplomats and Afghan experts who could see what was happening and reported to their governments. Um, but I think the United States and its allies just either did not care or did not act in these critical years after 2001, so between 2001 and 2005. Or even later, I'd say, you know, still opportunities perhaps up to as late as 2008, 2009. And diplomats and Afghan experts, such as you know, senior EU diplomat Michael Semple, um, Mervyn Patterson, the former senior UN official, um, who tried to reach out uh, and sort of you know persuade uh, and, tribal yeah. networks to uh, to to realign themselves um, with 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 a, with a different a, a, a reformed Afghan government, um, were ultimately expelled, of course, by President Hamid Karzai uh, for their for their mediation efforts. And I think, unfortunately, you know. The West, uh, United States, Europe, etc. We, we were largely silent about that, and we did very little in response. This was a humiliating uh, thing to do to senior to senior international uh, civil servants, and, and we didn't make too much of it, unfortunately. However, nonetheless, by sort of 2006, 2007, NATO was, of course, worried about the rising insurgency. But clumsy attempts to rectify the situation could often make the situation could often make matters worse. For example, the UK's insistence in replacing the admittedly corrupt governor of Helmand province uh, removed one of the most powerful tribal leaders in the province, but did little to assuage tribal opposition to President Hamid Karzai's government. And that approach, of course, flip-flopped again in 2010 when the US started championing uh, Kandahari uh, uh, Chief of Police uh, Abdul Razak, um, despite his uh, his reputation for large-scale abuse and graft. So in the one, you know, sometimes we were in favor, in terms of dealing with corruption, it was rather haphazard and, and, and lacked a kind of, um, you know, clear political guidance or, or strategy. Um, I would say also that, of course, the urgency of the US imposed military timeline meant that they had little time for insisting on political reform. And it was often strange to me that you know, successive ISAF commanders used to quote David Galula, who was, w w when it came to designing plans to counter the insurgency in Afghanistan. Galula, of course, wrote his famous a uh, book on counterinsurgency based on his experiences in Algeria. But US officers, while appreciating his tactical guidance, um, often missed his, his key messages on strategy. And that was the real lesson of, of, of Algeria. In, the, in Algeria, the French military was thoroughly embedded with the local population. Uh, Paris deployed thousands of military off officers specialized in local government and fluent in Arabic. For a while, through the use of local militias, development projects, and careful intelligence gathering, the French gained the tactical upper hand against the Algerian insurgency. But the political context was fundamentally wrong. The government in Paris had no long-term political solution to the conflict in Algeria. And so, of course, France lost politically, not militarily. And that was Galuda's key message, the, the primacy of policy over military uh, tactics. Now, France, I, I, to, to be fair, in the case of ISAF, I think France understood that lesson um, in Afghanistan much more than the United States. Um, following the election of, of, of Barack Obama, when uh, uh, President Sarkozy raised France's uh, troop deployment to ISAF to just under 4,000 and indeed assumed a, a lead military role in, in Kabul and neighboring uh, Kapisa province. Um, however, in 2010 and 2011, France's experiences in Kabul and Kapisa raised serious questions over the political viability of, of, of the ISAF mission. Um, they found that ultimately their, their most dangerous adversary in Kapisa province was Hamid Karzai's provincial governor, who was collaborating with the insurgency and directly responsible for, for the uh, for coalition deaths and violent extortion among the local population. And eventually, after a sustained French diplomatic campaign, he, the governor was actually removed uh, by President Hamid Karzai. But French diplomats were then appalled when the deputy attorney general who was supposed to investigate the former governor was removed by President Karzai. Um, this deputy uh, attorney general had also um, started a number of investigations into corruption or, um, or collusion by some of Karzai's uh, closest associates. So throughout 2010, 2011, French diplomats um, expressed their concerns over, over these rising levels, this, this, this type of behavior and rising levels of corruption. And actually US military senior officers often admitted that their contracting and, and oversight procedures were deeply flawed and that they caused corruption on a massive scale on the part of the Karzai government. And, and of course, we're indirectly funding the insurgency through the payment of protection money by subcontractors. 
But despite the evidence of reform on the on the part of the Afghan government, several, um, uh, of course, se several Afghan anti-corruption agencies were shut down. Um, they have been set up by the international community and were, were deliberately shut down or obstructed by President Karzai. Um, and despite this, U.S. assistance to Afghanistan almost trebled in, from from uh, uh, 2008 to 2011. And when the IMF, you know, tried to move in in 2011 and say, you know, that actually. Um, uh, th there needed to be a negotiation by future financial aid packages to Afghanistan uh, because of the failure of the Afghan government to respond to the theft of billions of dollars of aid money and allegations around Kabul Bank particularly. And they were supported by Germany and France, but opposed by um, the US military. And the US military's rationale is that Congress had given a lot of money in a very, to spend in a very short time period and that they had to do that. And ultimately, France and Germany were interfering with uh, ISAF's campaign cycle. Ultimately, the military prevailed um, and, again, you know, missed opportunities to deal with uh, a really endemic uh, systematic corruption uh, at the heart of uh, government in Kabul. And, of course, France then removed its troops uh, early from the ISAF mission in 2012 in response to what it regarded as its political failure uh, to influence the United States or the Afghan government. So I think what we've seen is, you know, in terms of the, um, as we move then into the transition cycle, of course, um, we didn't, we didn't see a significant shift in, in this type of behavior. And to some extent, it, it got worse. Um, NATO was in a hurry to extricate its combat troops um, and was less willing to uh, deal with or listen to um, serious allegations of corruption or abuse. Um, and one of the ways to try and get around what was seen as an inefficient or corrupt central government, of course, was setting up local militias, such as the Afghan local police. But of course, there was very little oversight over these initiatives. They were not plugged into the Afghan central, central government, and they tended to be dependent upon uh, particularly US special forces assistance. Um, so there was government in a box. So it was sort of hand, so the attempts to engineer this, this uh, district level type governance uh, that was ultimately divorced from central government may have given a sort of short term uh, a tactical effect, perhaps. But in terms of long term, it was entirely uh, unsustainable since, since the Afghan government was not particularly involved in much of it. Um, and, and it certainly was not, you know, was not, did not have the capacity to sustain any of the perhaps short term achievements that were um, gained. So in, to conclude, because um, I believe my time is pretty much up, um, I would say even if we leave outside the morality of, of Biden's decision, I think in terms of the US national interest, I would argue that the, the rush 2020 2021 US withdrawal from Afghanistan was and, and is an astonishing high risk gamble. I mean, just because there was sort of you know, so much uh, you know, problematic behavior, much of it linked to our excessive sort of splurge of assistance in a very tight time period in a country with very weak capacity. And it, it politically, um, it, it was essentially, you know, a, a politically incoherent and I would say uh, a government that was you know, too abusive, and un until we had sort of you know used some leverage to try and reform the government, you know that 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 levels of aid spending should never have been uh, injected into the country. But nonetheless, that does not mean that sort of sudden uh, you know sudden withdrawal is 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 a responsible thing to do either. And I think ten years later, Afghanistan is you know still the sharpest of reminders in terms of how domestic hubris, particularly in the U.S. capital, can lead to foreign policy disaster. The politics of the war in Afghanistan, the civil war dynamics, of course, were wrong. Uh, but so too was this sudden disengagement. I'd say instead of trying to maintain influence, which if the behavior of the Taliban and the Afghan government, the Trump administration set a course for unilateral withdrawal, whether any obligations or much incentive for the Taliban to fulfill part of their uh, part of the uh, to fill their part of the withdrawal agreement signed last year. So despite corruption and dysfunctionality at the top, Afghan soldiers were, I would say, remarkably willing to keep fighting as long as they had limited use um, of the United States um, Air Force on their side. Um, after all, the Taliban were and are not popular with a large proportion of the Afghan population. But once this component of U.S. military assistance was substantially and rapidly reduced, then the Afghan military's morale collapsed. Uh, and so what can we do now? Well, I mean, it is, of course, just as a side note, it's, of course, interesting to note that France is one of the few countries to more accurately predict the collapse of the government of President Ashraf Ghani. But in terms of that's that's now in the past, and we have to think about what Ireland, particularly maybe you know this month in the UN Security Council, can do, and and what what uh, what what the international community or, and and of course uh, you know the West uh, can can do to sort of I would we I think we still have a moral obligation. Simply walking away from uh, this is, is is not moral either, and you can look at it as, as a reparation of as a sort for. But I think that many people in Afghanistan who are living in fear and 
uh, and living under a, a, a new and very brutal regime would not thank us for simply saying that um, you know we've done enough harm and we can't do any and, and, and insist that we can't do any good. I think we can do some good. Um, I would say that you know in terms of some of the immediate lessons that come to mind, I think the you know first of all the authority of the United Nations should never be squandered, um, and I think really it's it's Ireland can work hard now and is i believe working hard to to put the un back at the center of international negotiations mediation with the taliban in kabul um if you look at the the history of us pakistan qatari turkish mediation etc saudi mediation i think it has both proved to be quite partial uh you know prejudice towards national interest and ineffective um so i think we really need now is a sort of un very high-powered special envoy and i think the biden administration should be persuaded to back this and, and channel much of um its relations uh, on the future of Afghanistan through him or her. I think there can be a special envoy. This is no disrespect that Deborah Lyons, the current special representative, but I think there can also be a, a sort of senior uh, political special envoy for strategic political engagement with the Taliban leadership in a series of talks. And then there can also be a head of UNAMA uh, to deal with the growing, the exceptionally growing, uh, rapidly growing uh, work that the United Nations uh, you know, has to, to do in terms of operational delivery, not least uh, humanitarian assistance inside the country. Um, I would say sanctions should be applied where necessary, but not unilaterally, and these must be through the United Nations. And again, Ireland you know, is a good place to insist on that now. Um, I think you know, we need to acknowledge as well that there will be a lot more war in Afghanistan. The Taliban movement is likely to fracture to some extent. We don't know exactly to what extent. And there will be more resistance in Afghanistan. I'm afraid that the nature of the Taliban's rule and the atrocities that it's carrying out will foster resistance. And we in Europe need to think very carefully about how we view, view and respond to that resistance. Um, I don't think we should overstate how factional the Taliban movement is, but we should never cease to look for opportunities for, for parts of that movement to reject more extreme elements, including even in its leadership. And we should not confuse stability under a brutal Taliban regime for necessarily for, um, for progress, um, particularly if the Taliban continues to support, uh, as it has increasingly been doing, international terrorist groups that severely destabilize the region and are launch attacks elsewhere. I think the West is actually not alone in this concern. I think mean, despite their sort of hubristic celebration of, of the bloody nose to the United States, the UK and others, I think Russia, China and Iran, although, you know, are, are also concerned about this prospect. And I would say so are elements within the Pakistani state. Um, secondly, I would just say that, you know, we should also uh, never forget in future that there's no such thing as purely technical or humanitarian assistance in countries in or emerging from conflict. Um, a former head of UPOL once said that he was there, he did not need political advice since his mission was a technical one. Uh, working in Afghanistan, a place where weak and highly politicized civil service, it is essential to understand the wider context in which training programs and other assistance is delivered uh, to, in order to recognize and prevent abuse. There is no work point, for example, working with a, um, an attorney general on anti-corruption, even if, uh, if, if he is continuously proven to be the source of much corruption. And the same applies to Mali and elsewhere where we're currently, where the EU is currently engaged. I think also bottom up can never replace top down. So, you know, the United States and NATO tried to engineer their way district by district around a corrupt Afghan central government without understanding that, you know, ultimately th 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 that was unsustainable. Um, and the, the center of gravity was not necessarily in Helmand, uh, you know, a province with three, four percent of the population of the country, but in, in Kabul. Um, and it is, all, I would say, finally, finally, it's always right to tell allies when they're wrong. I think ultimately you will be more respected as a result. In 2012, some UK defence analysts, you know, always a touch competitive, of course, about its relations with Washington, observed that Paris will be punished for its stance in Afghanistan. I, I don't think it was. And if anything, I think US respect for French defence capabilities has risen since. Um, sadly, I'm, I'm not convinced that the same can be said for the UK. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion and the, the questions.